What is going on? Welcome to the episode. Today we're going to be talking about the metabolism in relation to fat loss and whether you can temporarily or even permanently damage it. So first off, we need to define the difference between the terms adaptation and damage. So let's look at weight training because it's a super clear example of the difference between these two phenomena. When we go to the gym and lift weights, we stress our muscles, they adapt, and as a result, they get bigger and stronger. Getting bigger and stronger is an adaptation to the stimulus, the stimulus being lifting weights. Damage, on the other hand, would be an example of going into the gym and stressing a muscle, tendon, or ligament so much that you actually tear it. So this is not an adaptation, it's a full-blown injury. Tearing your ACL, MCL, or PCL in your knee are classic examples. Dislocating your shoulder is another example. These are illustrations of damage, not adaptation. So how do these two concepts relate to your metabolism? When we lose weight, we burn fewer calories doing the same activities. So for example, I'm going to burn more calories heading out for a five kilometer walk at 200 pounds versus 175 pounds because I'm lugging around more weight, bigger animals burn more calories than smaller animals. And you can think about this just like cars. A 4x4 truck is going to use far more fuel driving 10 miles than a smart car is. Now, we wouldn't say that the smart car is damaged in relation to the 4x4 truck. We'd just say that it's a smaller car with lower fuel requirements. The body is the exact same way, meaning all things being equal. If you start your fat loss journey at 220 pounds and you're now 180 pounds, you're going to use less energy doing the same activity. Your metabolism isn't damaged, it's just that your body has different fuel requirements at 220 versus 180. This is perfectly normal. It's simply adaptation. Now, if you were to throw on a backpack and load it up with 40 pounds worth of weight to account for the 40 pounds of fat that you lost, you would actually burn a very similar amount of calories to when you were 40 pounds heavier because all of a sudden you would be moving around the same amount of weight. Some folks are actually doing this, by the way. They're wearing weighted vests to make up for the weight that they've lost, which allows them to sidestep this entirely normal adaptive response and burn the same amount of pre-weight loss calories doing the same activities. Now it's worth mentioning that as we lower our calorie intake, which is required to lose fat, lots of folks tend to subconsciously change their movement behavior. Meaning when they eat fewer calories, they tend to move around less in general. So let's say that they forgot their phone upstairs. If they're in a calorie deficit, they're more likely to be like, ah, forget it. I'll grab it later. Versus if they're eating more than enough calories, they're more likely to hop up and go get their phone immediately. This is just one example. Fortunately, there's a really easy, simple, and straightforward solution to this potential subconscious adaptation, and it's counting your steps. This way, you know exactly how much you're moving throughout the day, and it's a really accurate measure. Conventional cardio, on the other hand, is typically a fairly poor measure of activity throughout the day if you're not counting your steps. Reason being is, let's say that you're doing 30 minutes of quote unquote cardio on the elliptical five times per week. If you're not counting your steps throughout the day, how do you know that you're not simply canceling out that 30 minute cardio bout via moving around even less throughout the rest of your day? Let's get even more specific with this example. Let's say that you're doing about 8,000 steps per day, but you're not tracking them. So you don't know that you're doing 8,000 steps per day, but you are in fact averaging about 8K daily. You decide that you're going to implement 30 minutes on the elliptical five times per week because you want to get leaner. And on those five days, you just end up subconsciously or consciously moving around less due to that cardio session and all of a sudden you're averaging say 4,000 steps per day. So yes, you added 30 minutes of cardio five times per week, but you also cut your step count in half. This is one example of how folks start implementing formal exercise 
and don't actually lose a single pound. They simply adapt their behavior and their energy output is a wash as a result. Folks also do this in terms of food too. For example, let's say that they start running 10 kilometers a week. They often move around less throughout the remainder of their days, but they also tend to eat more because they overestimate the caloric burn from that 10K run total each week. And you can easily gain weight in a scenario like this, and we hear about it, right? Folks say that they start exercising and they actually gain weight. It's because they're changing their behavior in one way or another in regards to energy in or energy out or both. Probably the most pertinent point of this episode is that if your metabolism could get damaged, how would starvation be a thing? Because if folks ate less, their metabolisms would be quote unquote damaged, they'd burn fewer calories and stay alive. It turns out that that obviously doesn't happen because we all have ancestors that have passed from starvation. So it's actually a bit of a slap in the face to our lineage to say that we can't lose weight nowadays due to damaged metabolisms when millions of folks literally died from lack of food access. So fortunately, the truth is you don't have a damaged metabolism. And some coaches out there use this metabolic damage verbiage as a marketing tactic, which I'm not crazy about. I'm sure that in some instances their intentions are good and they just don't know how this stuff works on a biological level, which if that's the case is a little bit alarming because if you do this for a living and you don't understand the concept of thermodynamics, you've got to get your head in a textbook ASAP. However, it is what it is because that marketing message tends to attract a certain type of personality that type of personality who wants to believe that they're doing everything right and it can't possibly be that they're not losing weight because of their actions. It has to be some sort of outside circumstance that's out of their control. And in this case, it's their metabolism, AKA it's not their fault. They're off the hook. Why even bother trying, right? Other folks like to believe that it's the fault of their hormones or menopause and the list goes on. But again, the fortunate truth is your metabolism is not damaged. The body doesn't lie. And a funny little aside is that the concept of damaged metabolisms are only talked about in societies where food is abundant. Coincidence? Uh, I don't know, I don't know. So if a fitness professional says to you that you're not losing weight because you're starving your body and it's holding on to fat because you're eating too few calories, run. Run in the other direction because that's actually insane and in direct conflict with the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Now, sometimes you'll hear folks say that they started eating more and they began to lose fat. And it's really important that we define the difference between which more we're talking about here. Are we talking about more calories or more food volume? For example, if you have 1500 calories to eat throughout the day, on one hand, you could choose to eat a big ass burger and fries and likely knock out your 1500 calories right there just from that. Or you could choose 1500 cows worth of food from single ingredient whole foods like lean meats, egg, fish, seafood, potatoes, rice, veggies, fruit, etc. And the food volume is going to be way larger from the whole foods than it is from the burger and fries. So it depends how you define more. The total calories are the same, but the food volume is completely different depending on your food choices due to the different caloric density of various food choices. It also feels like you're eating more with the whole food setup and you're going to feel far more satiated, which is one of the main reasons why I emphasize single ingredient whole foods for fat loss especially, but 1500 calories is 1500 calories just like a pound of bricks weighs the exact same as a pound of feathers. There's also an adherence piece to this psychological puzzle around food intake, which I want to mention because sometimes folks will say, no, Marcus, I started eating more food volume, but also more calories and I started getting leaner. What often happens in this scenario is that occasionally folks will increase their calorie intake from say whole foods, feel more satiated, and then not reach for super calorie dense afternoon or late night snack options and they think I upped my calorie intake and started losing weight 
but they actually didn't because we so often misreport and misremember how much we actually ate if we're not tracking really diligently. So yes, they may have added calories to their baseline intake, but that increase in calories actually boosted their overall adherence to their program. They were less likely to deviate from that baseline intake, which therefore lowered their total calories due to the unaccounted for and often forgotten snacks, handfuls of nuts, squares of chocolate, bites of cheese, alcohol, eating while drinking, so just always keep in mind, the body never lies. If something isn't adding up, it's not because your body isn't doing the math correctly, it's because there's a leak somewhere in your tracking metrics. It's sort of like loosely accounting for your spending habits and then looking at your bank account at the end of the month and assuming that the bank did the math wrong, even though you weren't recording all of your spending because you were just sort of going by feel. You had some extras here and there and thought, yeah, it's all good, what's 100 calories here and an extra glass of wine there and all of a sudden, there goes your results, right? All of those little expenses add up to a lot more than it felt like they did in the moment. There's also a thermic effect of food advantage to favoring single ingredient whole foods over hyper palatable processed foods from a calorie cost of digestion standpoint, meaning there are more calories that get burned in the digestion process when you eat a diet rich in whole foods versus processed foods, which does give you a small fat loss advantage as well, which I just wanted to touch on quickly as a little aside. I explained this in a lot more detail in episode 151, so have a listen to that if you're interested in learning more about the thermic effect of food. So, can you damage your metabolism from eating too low of calories? Fortunately not. Starvation wouldn't exist if that was the case, and so if you're not losing weight, something needs to change in regards to the energy in and energy out equation. Where would I recommend starting with that? I would recommend tracking your food intake in one way or another via just simply writing it down in the notes on your phone, taking pictures of your meals using MyFitnessPal, whatever you'd prefer, and accounting for your steps. That's it. Everything will become incredibly clear after doing this diligently for say 10 to 14 days. And the cool thing is that lots of folks actually start losing fat simply by starting to track their nutrition and steps for two reasons. One being they're more aware of their food choices that they're making and therefore they make better decisions, which lowers their overall calorie intake. And two, they're more aware of how much they're moving due to tracking how much they're moving and typically end up moving more as a result. And increasing your movement burns more energy. Awareness is a very powerful tool when it comes to fat loss. So this is all amazing news if results are your number one priority because there isn't some outside circumstance stopping you from reaching your goals. The ball is in your court and that is so empowering because by changing your behavior, you can instantly start moving in the direction of progress. Now, sometimes it can be difficult to essentially accept this reality that the body just doesn't lie because if, for example, you've been trying to lose weight for, I don't know, a decade, it can be hard to come to terms with the fact that it truly was just your behavior that was limiting you. And that can be a tough pill to swallow. I'm speaking from experience. I went through this myself. I underestimated how much I was truly taking in calorie wise over the course of weeks and months and overestimated how much energy I was burning via things like workouts. I spun my wheels not for weeks or months, for years. And fortunately, given this information, I'm here to tell you that you don't have to make the same mistakes that I made. You can get results far faster than I ever did if you really take on and implement these concepts, I promise. If you're interested in applying for one-on-one -on -one nutritional coaching and or workout design with me, you can click the link in the description below or head on over to n1fitness.com forward slash coaching. Follow me up on Instagram at n1fitness, on TikTok at the n1fitness, and feel free to friend me on Facebook at Marcus Sadu. I would love to hear from you. Thanks so much to the folks that have taken an extra 30 to 60 seconds out of their day to leave a review on their favorite podcast platform. I really, really appreciate it. Lastly, 
be sure to hit the subscribe button. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you found this useful. I hope that it was an empowering message and I will catch you on the next episode. See ya. Thank you.